There we go. So good morning, everyone. 9.30 a.m. New York City live. Uh, here we are for another class of deep learning. And this time we're going to have Mark Aurelio Renzato with us, which is going to be talking about uh, translation and so many interesting uh, things, especially with low uh, scarcity, uh, like with scarcity of, of data. Uh, Mark Aurelio is a research scientist and manager at the Facebook AI research in, in the lab here at New York City. Uh, he's generally interested in machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and more generally artificial intelligence. His long-term endeavor is to enable machine to learn from weaker supervision and to effectively transfer knowledge across tasks, possibly leveraging the comp uh, compositional structure of natural signals. Moreover, he's from Padova, Italy, uh, and he's a fellow engineer, electronical, electronical engineer, electrical engineer. Is it electronical? Electrical. I guess it's electrical in English. Uh, after spending several months in uh, Caltech, he started a PhD uh, in computer science at New York University with our um, common supervisor here, Jan Lecan. Uh, afterwards, in 2009, he joined Geoffrey Hinton Labs as a postdoc. In 2011, uh, he moved to industry and was one of the first very early members of the Google Brain team. In 2013, he joined Facebook and was a founding member of the Facebook AI Research Lab. And so, uh, with no further ado, uh, I'm looking forward to listen to this spectacular lecture, lecture from Marco Aurelio. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all right. in, fact, in fact, you could <laughs> yeah. you could say that Marco Aurelio, Marco Aurelio was at Facebook before I was uh, oh, wow. preceding me by, by, by about six months. You could say to some extent that he kind of hired me at, at Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. All right, I will disappear from the from the camera. Thank you for having me. It is a great honor to be here uh, and to tell you a little bit about machine translation. And in particular, uh, machine translation when you don't have a lot of um, label data. Okay? Um, and, and the idea is that hopefully you will learn about a, a practical application of deep learning, in this case to, for machine translation, but there are some principles that uh, you can hopefully uh, generalize to other applications. So let's review what is machine translation. Uh, so you know, everything starts with data. So uh, let's assume that we have um, uh, what we call a parallel data set, which is a data set that consists of uh, a collection of parallel sentences. So a sentence in the foreign uh, language, let's say Italian, with a corresponding translation in English, which is, uh, let's say, our target language. And so we have a large data set where we have a lot of sentences in Italian with a corresponding translation in English. Okay, so now this is our label uh, data. And now let's review uh, how you train a machine translation system to fit this data and hopefully generalize to new uh, sentences in Italian in this case. So the way that this is done is by, uh, these days is by training a neural machine translation system. Uh, this is the architecture is these days a transformer, uh, and this is trained uh, by stochastic gradient descent. So the way that it works is that um, you try to model uh, the join probability of all the order sequence of tokens in the uh, target sentence, uh, given the source sentence. And uh, of course, you are trying to maximize this probability um, uh, uh, over the set of parameters of your model, right? Uh, now, uh, one way to, so we maximize this by using the uh, product rule of probability theory. And so now the join probability of all the sequence of tokens, let's say the cat set on the mat, and let's say that each token is one word here. Uh, so you have a string that is composed by, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, tokens. Is You can write it as the product of a token given the prefix and the source sentence, okay? So in the log space, then this product becomes a sum. And so that's what you see here. Uh, I hope you see my cursor. Uh, and so you, you write this joint distribution as, as the sum of the log probabilities of one token on the target side for, for, in this case, the, uh, this is a word from the English uh, sentence, given the prefix and the source sentence, okay? 
And so essentially, everything boils down to a bunch of classification tasks, right? So it's very easy. And all these classifiers share parameters. So um, let's dive a little bit more in the detail to uh, make sure that we understand how this works. So let's say that our uh, source sentence is this Italian sentence, which is translated into English with the cassette on the map. Now, I'm going to abstract from the details of what is the architecture. So it really doesn't matter if it is a recurrent neural net, a convolution neural net, or a transformer. What I say applies to all of this, OK? Because I'm talking more about the algorithm uh, than uh, the specific architecture. And so I borrowed this old diagram from Jan where circles are variables and boxes are transformations between variables. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, depicting a recurrent neural net, but very much if you have a transformer, it just means that this uh, hidden state uh, is produced by a transformer block that depends on the input uh, token that is embedded here uh, and all the previous um, uh, hidden states. Okay? Uh, so in this case, we're doing language modeling, right? Because we're not considering the source sentence. And so in language modeling, what you do, given uh, the word at time t, you're trying to predict the word at the next time step. Okay, so from cat, you're trying to predict stat. But now we also had the source sentence, right? And so we should be able to do better than language model because we have actually access to the source sentence. And so um, uh, we should be able to do a better prediction if we also consider the information from the source sentence. And the way that uh, uh, we do this is by uh, taking uh, the feature representation, uh, the CT plus one, uh, and um, at the same time, by representing each word in the source sentence, so let's say that this is your recurrent neural network or transformer, for every input token, you have you eventually go to, uh, you represent this, okay? So uh, if it is a transformer, uh, for every token, you are gonna produce another token at the output, right? And so you got, uh, uh, let's say, a d-dimensional uh, vector here, which matches the dimensionality here. And so uh, what you do, you take a dot product between this uh, hidden state with all the hidden states coming from uh, the source tokens. And uh, after the dot product, you, you take a softmax. And so now you have a distribution of our tokens. So something weights that are positive and sum to one. And then uh, uh, you produce a representation of the whole source sentence it is conditional on this uh, CT plus one on the target side by multiplying these weights by the values. And the values could be some transformation of these uh, input uh, representations of the tokens. And so after you take away the sum with these weights, you get the vector. And then this vector gets combined with this CT plus one. Let's say you concatenate, you do some sort of transformation. You may have multiple layers. And eventually, you predict a distribution over the next world. Okay, and, uh, and you can apply cross entropy loss on this uh, distribution over the next word because you also have uh, the ground truth. You know what is the next word in the sequence. And so you do this for every token uh, at every position, and then you can backdrop through the whole thing. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, the overview of the mechanics of how to train uh, a sequence to sequence, -to -sequence model also for machine translation, but not only. Okay, so the cool thing about this is that um, you don't need to align. So for a long time, people in machine translation were a little obsessed with how do I align a word with, uh, on the target side with the word on the source side. This is learned by the model. And it is done in a soft way by using this uh, softmax, essentially. The other nice thing is that if uh, you're using a convolution neural net or a transformer, all these representations can be computed in parallel. And, uh, and so this is also very efficient. So, um, okay, so this is how you train the neural machine translation system. But essentially what we described here with this joint probability, blah, 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 <laughs> here, right? Um, you are scoring. So it means that for a given source sentence, you 
produce a score for a uh, translation for for a uh, for a sentence in the in uh, in the target language. But this doesn't mean that you can generate, right? The only thing that you can do is if I give you a sentence in Italian and another sentence in English, I can give you a score that tells you how plausible is that this sentence is actually a translation of the source sentence. And so how do we generate? The way that you generate, so there are many ways to generate. Uh, this uh, uh, most popular uh, way and, and also very effective is by using BIM decoding. And BIM decoding uh, tries to approximate uh, the maximum of uh, uh, tries to find the maximum in an approximate way of the probability distribution of y given x of your target given the, the input. You don't have y, so you maximize over y, right? And you you are given x, so you are searching on the space of y's. Of course, the space of y's is very very large, so you cannot do it exactly, and and, and therefore uh, you use some approximate um, technique like beam search. The way that BIM search works is that you start with uh, a beginning of sentence token, right? And so that's the very first step of your decoding. Uh, let's say it, it is your, uh, uh, actually before even this one, uh, you, you need to predict the, right? So you start from beginning of sentence, you, you, you're supposed to predict the, yeah? Uh, so from the beginning of sentence token, you produce at the upper, at the very top, a distribution over what is the first word in the sentence, right? And so each of these words will get a low probability score, okay? And so here you will have uh, as many words, as many uh, branches as uh, words, in, as tokens in your vocabulary. In this case, I'm using words, but um, it could be also uh, character engrams, okay? So let's say, uh, life has a uh, score minus one and today has score minus 0.5. And then what BIM search does is that among all these branches, it selects the top case scoring. Okay, so let's say that for us, K is equal to two. So then we, among all these scores, the one that scores the highest is life and today we score minus one and, and minus 0 0.5. Uh, after this, uh, uh, Beam search goes to the next step and says, okay, how about if I expand uh, life uh, in, in all the possible next tokens, okay? So now you expand vocabulary size from life. So you, you got life A, life the, life is, and, and so on and so forth. And the same with today, okay? So that's what you do. And so for every uh, next token, you got also log, log probability score, right? Or a score in general, it doesn't need to be normalized. Um, and uh, and now you need to compute a score for, for this path. And the score for this path is simply the sum of the scores on, on the um, arcs that compose this path. So in this case, you've got minus one plus minus one, which is minus two, okay? And the same for uh, life is, and the same for today this and today that, okay? So again, you have, in this case, two times vocabulary size uh, paths, and you're going to select the top K uh, uh, best scoring, highest scoring. So in this case, for us, between, let's say, minus 2, minus 1.5, minus 3, minus 3.5, you're going to select life was and life is. And you re repeat this process, right? So you got, then you go to the next, um, so you drop these branches, you keep, like, like was and like is, you expand this vocabulary size times one uh, one R for every uh, token in the vocabulary. You compute the uh, um, score for the path. You select the top two scoring paths. In this case, it's going to be life is beautiful and life is great. Uh, and you keep proceeding like this okay? until you hit uh, an end of sentence, okay? So, and then at the very end, you select the path that has the high, highest scoring uh, value. In this case, it is this path, okay? So that's the basic of BIM search, which is a greedy procedure, okay? Uh, there is a trade-off. The, 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 the bigger is the value of K in, in, um, in your top K selection, the better is the approximation, but also 
uh, you increase the computational cost. Uh, in practice, BIM search is pretty effective at, find, at finding um, high scoring paths, but it has also its own issues. For instance, let's say that in your data set, uh, La Vita Bella was translated two thirds of the time with life is beautiful and one third of the time with life is great. Now, when you do BIM search, BIM search is going to pick always the most likely path. And so assuming that the model is well calibrated, it's going to always translate uh, the sentence with the life is beautiful, 100% of the times. So that means that the translation that your system produces is going to be biased just because of the nature of the, of the max selection. And this may not be good. For instance, uh, let's say that you go from a language that is uh, not inflected like Chinese or English to one that is inflected like Italian or French, if you say, I don't know, that the truck driver is strong, okay, um, well, I don't know what is the gender of the truck driver, but in Italian or French, uh, well, in Italian for sure, you need to specify what is the gender. And now if you use uh, BIM search, you're going to you know, choose one of the, the two genders 100% uh, of the times, whatever was most frequent in your data set. And therefore you are going to introduce uh, some sort of bias. So this is one of the problems that you have with um, beam search. So it doesn't handle well uncertainty. And so there what are- What do you mean inflected? What well, does inflected inflected means, mean? Yes, uh, inflected means that uh, it's a language uh, that specifies, for instance, gender, number. So you have the ending on the word that changes with the gender, the number, for instance. Um, so, yeah. Um, and so let's say beautiful in English goes well both for male. Right, no, actually, this is a bad example. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> oh, boy. So if I say um, uh, driver, okay, the noun driver in English, applies to both female and male, but in Italian, uh, you need to specify the gender, right? Okay, okay. Um, and so, so now you may say, well, but, uh, since we have a scoring function that is a normalized probability distribution, what you could do is also to generate by sampling from the model. And that's a totally reasonable thing to do. Except that because uh, the uh, the distribution is produced by softmax. You never assign exactly probability zero to the tokens in the vocabulary. So that means that in the data, if you look at the actual data distribution, it's very spiky. So there are a lot of regions that have zero probability mass. Well, the uh, the model smudges probability mass a little bit everywhere, and that means that when you sample, you are pretty likely to hit places that are not very good, okay? So usually uh, sampling produces not very fluent sentences. They are very diverse, but not very fluent, not very good quality. So then people have come up with ways in between like this top case sampling where you say, uh, I can take uh, at every time step, I have a distribution over tokens at the next step. I uh, select the top K highest scoring words and a sample from those. So it's a bias sampling. And there is a huge literature on how to uh, generate, how to decode. There are uh, uh, re-ranking approaches, both generating discriminative. In discriminative re-ranking, in particular, you backpropagate through BIM search, essentially. And so you actually, instead of training for scoring, you actually train to generate. And so if you're interested in these topics, I can, I'd be happy to follow up with you and send your references. Uh, it is a very nice, and I think this connects also with what Oni uh, talked about uh, some time ago. And okay, so but for this lecture, I will stop here unless you have questions. And this is just covering the basic background about how, what is machine translation from the data, how you train it and how you use it, okay? So there is, a, there is a question actually from a student here. Yes. Uh, so the question is the following. So how does this work intuitively? I think the first step is what we did in homework three, which was uh, handwritten recognition. So to get a set of embeddings. Part two, 
uh, I am not quite sure how the dot product and softmax replaces the alignment. So is it something like the dot product is trying to find some which embeddings align with Z T plus one? So how is the okay. source and target uh, uh, sentences aligned? I think. Uh, so it, okay. So um, so the idea he, here is that uh, you are processing set. You have some representation coming from the prefix, okay? And now you want to include uh, a representation of the source. In particular, in order to predict the next word, you need to figure out, you know, essentially uh, what set maps to the source sentence. Uh, in this case is, is this uh, bigram here, this aseduto, uh, this sequence of two words, and uh, point the model that, you know, it should bump up the um, uh, probability of the translation of the word "soul," which in English is "on." Okay, um, and so if I were to do it by hand, what I would do is to say, I need to align. I need to figure out that SAC corresponds to these two things, and the next thing to translate is, is this word, which in, in English translates to this one. Okay, so this is like manual alignment. What I described here with this diagram essentially does it for you. So you let the model learn the alignment. How does it work? So you got you embed as uh, uh, um, you were saying, you embed each token, right? So you embed here each token. You have some way to refine this representation. So to produce contextualized embeddings. For, uh, for instance, if you have here a transformer block, okay? And now from these representations of these words, uh, we do a dot product with this hidden state, okay? So that essentially tells you which word on the source sentence matches with, with the word on the target sentence, right? That's the, what the dot product does. When you take the softmax, you are uh converting that score to something that is normalized that is like a probability distribution okay uh so the sum of all these numbers is one and they are all positive and let's say that you have a high score here for for uh this token that corresponds to to this work okay and now you need to convert these scores to a vector because that's what you need to plug into into the, de the decoder on the target side. And in order to convert this into a vector, you take, for instance, these vectors, maybe you transform them, and you take a weighted sum with these uh, scores. And that will give you a single vector that represents the whole uh, source sentence uh, for this specific target word, okay? And so it does alignment because of the dot product that you're kind of matching. And then, um, you know, if you look at, in practice, if you look inside a machine translation system and you look at these scores, they actually um, correspond to a somewhat interpretable alignment of the uh, target sentence with the source sentence. I don't know if it was clear. Yeah, and on the on the right hand side, so that Z T plus one comes from that also untrained F model, right? Or is it pre-trained? Un so in, initially, initially it is not trained. So uh, okay, it depends. Um, if you have if you do uh, if you have a very large label data set, then you start from random. Okay, you start from uh, randomly initialized weights, and so initially this F is going to be random, but you backprop through everything. And so you're gonna get a cross entropy loss here, gradients coming here, you update the parameters there, and also the gradients will flow through the, the encoder here, okay? And we'll, now, if you don't have a lot of label data, then you may want to pre-train um, and we'll go into that uh, in, the, in the next minutes. And so, so it would yes, be you, you, you can pre-train. With a language model, like a language model on the right-hand side. Yeah, so you can you can pre-train with a language model. You can pre-train with a language model that is uh, trained on multiple languages at once, uh, sharing parameters between the encoder and decoder. There are many ways to like BERT. I think you have been yeah, we, we talk about yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So the, so the, you can apply BERT on multiple languages at once, uh, and I will do it too. Yeah. Okay, makes 
Total sense. Oh, so the, the student is actually following up. How do you uh, feedback the fact that some sentences are uncertain? If you train uh, for a long okay. time with only one sentence to a sequence, aren't you going to eventually bias this network? Uh, is almost sorry. This network is almost going to get impulse probability, isn't it? Do you just stop early? Um, uh, could you repeat the second part of the, the, the very last sentence that you said? So, if you train for a long time with only yeah. one sentence to see. Uh, so only one sequ sequ sequence to sequence, aren't you going to eventually bias this network? Uh, hold on, maybe the sentence is broken. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's say, let's say that you have <clears throat> let's say that you have it's very much very much like with MNIST, right? Um, so let's say that <laughs> for the class zeros, um, you add an extra class, class eleven, and, and you say that. Uh, whenever you see a digit zero with probability 0.9, you assign the class, the, the label zero, which is the ground truth label, but with probability 0.1, you assign, uh, you assign class 11, okay? So, so now, you know, uh, whenever you see a digit zero, it could be class zero or 11, okay? Now, you can train this thing, and um, because you are trying to match the output distribution, uh, assume that you're not overfitting all of that. What happens is that uh, the, the distribution, the output is going to have 0.9 probability for label zero and 0.1 probability for uh, label 11, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you are if you're going to predict by taking the max, you're always going to uh, predict uh, label zero 100% of the time. But if you yeah. were to sample, then you would assuming that the model is well calibrated and doesn't work it, you would actually match the distribution that is in the data. Same here. So if you have a sentence that is translating uh, in multiple ways, the model should um, give you a, a probability distribution over all possible translations, um, assuming that the model is well calibrated. Okay. Okay, makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> that is actually a whole topic because essentially if you want to, of course, you know, you can help the model to deal with uncertainty by introducing latent variables, right? So now you can have a latent variable that a certain state of the latent variable that uh, allows you to translate in a, in, a, in a certain way. Let's say you go again from the non-inflected language to the inflected language, then you can have a state of the latent variable that produces all uh, things mm -hmm. in female singular, another state that can go on female plural and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, you can play with a model to, uh, to better represent this uncertainty, certainly. Um, I think we saw recently some, some news about like Google Translate and how uh, translating back and forth from Turkish to English, uh, the translation get basically uh, one way only, right? It gets like... Uh, yeah, it's not surprising. Again, just because usually when you do, when you decode with Beam Search, uh, the translation is very fluent. It is, you know, the majority class. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you go from something that is not inflected like English to Turkish, which is highly inflected, <laughs> and <laughs> back and forth, I mean, you're going to lose a, a lot by doing this because sure. uh, it's not that it produces a distribution over translations, but it just gives you one. And this is a problem also with, uh, I guess, the UI. Uh, other questions? That's it. These are, these are excellent questions, by the way. Um, thank you for asking. and. Feel free to ask more. Uh, I, I share obviously the slides with you. So even if I don't go through everything, uh, you will have access to the material and I prefer to make this interactive. So to conclude the review of machine translation at a pretty high level still. Uh, so we talked about training, we talked about inference, how to uh, generate from the machine translation system. The last part is evaluation. And I just say that the evaluation, well, unless you do human evaluation, Automatic evaluation is very simple. Essentially, you have, typically, you have uh, a source sentence, of course, and you have a human reference, a human translation. And you have a system hypothesis, so uh, a prediction for uh, the translation produced by the machine translation system. What you want to do is to 
match these two strings somehow. And the way that this is done currently, so there are a lot of metrics. Again, it's it's a huge literature here, but the most common uh, metric that is used today is called blue. And it is simply a geometric average, a geometric average of precision scores, where this PN here are uh, um, unigram, bigram, trigram, and foregram precision scores. So a unigram is a single word, a bigram is a sequence of two words, a trigram is a sequence of three words, and a foregram is a sequence of four words. A precision score simply checks whether a certain n-gram uh, that is present uh, in the system translation is also present in the human reference. And you count how many matches you have, and you compute a precision score like that. So it's essentially stream matching uh, at the level of engrams. Okay, so that that's all you need to know. And it is a number that usually is given between zero and hundred. I mean, it, it should be between zero and one, but we escape between zero and hundred. So hundred is perfect match. Like if you do perfect match, and zero if you don't get any single engram. Um, and, uh, but of course, as we said before, there is also the fact that for a given source sentence, there are multiple plausible translations. So it is very unlikely that you get 200. Uh, let's say for English, French, very good uh, translation systems on, on domains that match the training set, you get to something like 50, right? Because, uh, because of this uncertainty. Okay, so this was the recap about machine translation. Uh, essential application sequence to sequence modeling to the translation task. And let's step back and think about the assumptions that we made implicitly. So the first assumption is that the languages under considerations are Italian and English, which are two European languages that have quite a bit of commonality. The second assumption is that we have a, a label data set, right? So we have a lot of parallel sentences. Why do we need a lot? Because the neural machine translation system has a lot of parameters. If you look at a standard textbook, it would tell you that you need roughly three, <laughs> what was it, three uh, data points to estimate uh, each parameter, right? And here, you know, we are talking about models that have hundreds of millions of parameters, if not more. And do we have, uh, you know, three, four times uh, uh, parallel sentences? Maybe not. And so it turns out that there are 6,000 languages in the world. And we, uh, at least th the community working on machine translation is very English uh, focused and very uh, European languages focused. And but it turns out that, you know, only 5% of the world population is native English speaker. In fact, uh, the top 10 languages account only for 50% uh, of the population, meaning that the distribution of speakers in each language is very heavy tail. And you have a lot of people speaking uh, uh, languages that, that are spoken overall by very few people, okay? But overall, this uh, sum of small populations makes a big fraction of the world population. So this is a problem, right? Because essentially, if you look at um, uh, machine translation engines, uh, Google Translate, Bing, uh, whatnot, they only are able to translate to and from English, typically, and only for 100 or so languages. That means that there is a huge tail in the distribution that, of languages that we are not uh, currently translating. Are not able to translate. And now I think that honestly, there is kind of little hope to translate the languages in the uh, far right of the tail because many of these languages are only spoken, they are not even written. You barely find any digitized uh, resources. But for the intermediate section here that I show in yellow, I think there is hope. And for these languages, maybe you don't have a parallel data set. But perhaps you have at least text, raw text in each language. And the question is, can you use this unlabeled data to build a machine translation system? And so why is this a problem? Uh, you can see it from here. So the gray area is how much parallel data there is going into English for a bunch of uh, languages, okay? So from the one that is the, that, uh, that is highest resource to the one that is lowest resource. 
And the darker area is the performance of current machine translation system. And so you can see that there is kind of a phase transition here below a certain amount of parallel data, the quality degrades a lot. And, and, and in this area, really, the machine translation system is doing so poorly that it's not useful. And so currently, you need a lot of label data in order to train uh, machine translation systems. And so let's think about how we would build, let's say, an English Nepali machine translation system. Nepali is a language spoken in Nepal, lovely country uh, with 25 million people. So it's not, you know, uh, very few people, right? And it turns out that uh, the amount of parallel data is very, very small in this case. So uh, it's not what we were depicting before. So if you're interested in machine translation, if you're interested in general uh, on corpora uh, that are translated in multiple languages for whatever, for tax classification, for, for whatever purposes, you can go to this website. It is a public repository of all the avail available parallel data. It is very, very nice. So if you enter English Nepali, for instance, it gives you this list, which you can download for free, of data sets. And now, if you look at the number of sentences, uh, you realize that the uh, sources that have the largest number of sentences are JW300, which is Jehova Witnesses uh, magazines. And then you have Genome and KD4, which are Ubuntu handbooks. So you see the problem, right? So the problem is that essentially the, the uh, a, you don't have a lot of uh, parallel sentences, and B, the parallel sentences that you have are in domains that are not super useful, that are uh, either uh, noisy because like Wikimetrics, they are uh, automatically aligned, so uh, it's not very high quality, or if it is high quality, it is in very niche domains that are generally, you're not interested in translating new sentences from you know, uh, a Ubuntu handbook, right? And so uh, what is machine translation in practice for the large uh, um, majority of the languages? So uh, it, it looks like this. So let's say that now let's represent with boxes uh, the sentences. So the blue boxes, uh, sentences in English and the red boxes are the corresponding translation in Nepali. So it turns out that a parallel data set is an object that is a little bit more complicated because it is composed by some sentences that originate in English and some that originate in Nepali. And so now I'm gonna show with an empty box uh, the human translations. And so in this case, this uh, red empty box corresponds to the human translation of these sentences in English. They come from the domain Bible, while these sentences in Nepali originate in Nepali Pali are from the parliamentary data of Nepal, uh, and they are translated in English. Okay? So now you may agree with me that translating novel sentences from the Bible is not the most interesting thing to do. So maybe what you want to do is really translate, let's say, news data from English into Nepali. But the problem is that you don't have parallel data uh, in the news domain. If you're lucky, what you have is Monolingual data. So monolingual data is just text, raw text, without a corresponding translation in, in a given language. So maybe you have just news in English, let's say from BBC or whatnot, and you have news in Nepali from local news outlets over there. And eventually what you want to do is to translate novel uh, news data, uh, that's your test set, from English to Nepali. How are you going to do that? So it was not obvious to me when we were looking at this problem. And it turns out that the problem is actually a bit more complicated. In a way, by being more complicated, it, it becomes simpler to solve in the sense that you just not, uh, besides having data for English and Nepali, you also have perhaps data in other languages, for instance, Hindi. Now, Nepali and Hindi belong to the same family. And Hindi is much higher resource than Nepali. And perhaps you, you can find uh, a large parallel data set between English and Hindi, but perhaps it is on another domain. And if we take this a step further, you will find that 
what you can collect is a data set where you have multiple domains here across the rows and multiple languages here across, uh, across the columns. Then what you want to do is to translate news data from English to Nepali. Uh, the question is, can you leverage all these grid of data sets to improve generalization of your machine translation system? And so this is a Mondrian-like learning setting, which I don't think you can find in, uh, in your textbook. And, and uh, one goal of my lecture here is to tell you how to tackle this uh, learning setting. Um, any questions so far? No, no, I don't see. Yeah, I don't see any question here. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, the take-home message is that oftentimes, when you know, <laughs> I love doing modeling, I love coming up with uh, new algorithm, new architectures, but and oftentimes when we think that that's the coolest thing to do, right? So uh, pretty much, you know, uh, when we're given tasks, we're given a data set. We spend 90% of the time figuring out a good architecture, a, a good learning algorithm. Uh, but in practice, the, the, the picture is a little different. In practice, where you get the data? So given a task, figuring, figuring out what is a good data set for solving the task is a challenging problem. And it takes a lot of time to coming up with a good data set. And if you don't have a lot of, parallel, a lot of uh, in general, labeled data, you need to come up with ways to uh, fantasize data or to come up with auxiliary tasks, okay? So I, I would say that uh, in practice, uh, in my experience, uh, there is a lot of science here on the data side that is often neglected uh, when we study machine learning. Moreover, uh, after you get some data, you come up with some model, then there is a lot of effort that goes also in analyzing what the model does, analyzing the properties of the data. And there are a lot of feedback loops that go back from the model to the data, from the analysis to the model and data in order to, I don't know, uh, clean up the data, to extend the data, to refine the model. And not to mention when you go to deploy, there are other considerations like, I don't know, is my model fitting the computational budget that I have? And then you need to go back to the model or is, the model performing well across the whole input distribution, in which case you need to go back to the data. And so there is, it's an iterative process. And so I think it is important to understand that uh, there is a whole picture. Oftentimes we focus on the model side because we are machine learning practitioner and we love that. But uh, if you want to solve an application, you need to have the whole picture in, in your mind. And so the goal of this lecture is not to talk much about I, mean, I won't talk about architectures at all. I will talk about some algorithms, but I will also touch on data and analysis. So the second um, uh, tip is that whenever you don't have a lot of label data, you can do two things. You can downscale the model and say, hey, I'm going to do small scale learning. But usually that's not a good idea. So instead, what you... Uh, I would encourage you to do is to think about ways to gather more data to get uh, coming up with auxiliary tasks. It could be unsupervised. It could be uh, some related tasks, supervised related tasks, but come up with uh, ways to enlarge your data set and to do large scale learning. And usually that is the thing that is going to generalize much better. And so what is low resource machine translation? So given that a model has an uh, order of 100 million parameters or more, for me, low resource machine translation is a machine translation task where the number of parallel sentences is less than 10,000. Okay? So usually when you have so little parallel data, uh, the performance, if you just use the parallel data set, is very poor. And the challenges are, of course, as I said, where to source data to train on, uh, coming up also with high quality evaluation data sets, because if you don't have a good way to measure performance, then it's very difficult to make progress. Uh, that relates to also uh, challenges related to the metrics. How do you do human evaluation? It's not very easy to find people who speak low resource languages uh, or people who are, maybe they speak, but they are not fluent in the other language. Um, 
it's not easy to do automatic evaluation. For instance, if you take uh, Burmese, the, it's not a language that where they segment words. And so uh, you need to come up with different ways to uh, measure the error, uh, your blue. And then there are, of course, modeling challenges uh, to what is a good learning paradigm where you have so many data sets from so many languages and so many domains. Um, and because it is a large scale learning problem, how do you scale up uh, efficiently? In addition to this, there are the general machine translation challenges, some of which we discussed before, like exposure bias, the fact that usually we are training for scoring, but eventually we are interested in generation. And so uh, there is the question of, can you, can you train for generation? Because that's ultimately your task. How do you model uncertainty? How, uh, uh, what are better metrics than blue? Um, if you have a budget for the computation, how do you train, take into account that you have uh, such a thing? Or how do you model the long tail of the distribution? For instance, uh, uh, meaning that not all errors um, matter the same. Let's say that you are translating news and, and uh, the news is uh, the Coca-Cola stock price fell by 10%. And now you're replacing Coca-Cola with Pepsi. I don't know, I'm just making a stupid example, but you can see that that simple word replacement can have a huge effect downstream, right? So, um, so then how do you detect these rare errors and how do you um, measure them and how do you fix them? Okay, so... Um, what I plan to do today, so this was kind of the introduction, <laughs> an hour long introduction. And what I was planning to do today was to walk you through this cycle research, the way that I uh, think about it, at least. So uh, the cycle research for me uh, goes around three pillars. One is data. So you need to source data to train and you need to figure out also where to evaluate. And depending on what you want to to explore, you need to come up with different data sets and, and, uh, and there is a whole science uh, there on data collection. After you get some data, you go to the model, of course, that's the thing that we love doing. And so you need to design an architecture, you need to come up with an algorithm to, to feed the data and to generalize to, to new data from the distribution or a similar distribution. After you have done the modeling comes analysis, right? And so you can analyze several things. For instance, in this paper, we were analyzing how well the model distribution fits the data distribution. So we were analyzing the model. In this other paper, we were analyzing the metric. And in the paper that I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to analyze the data, okay? So you can analyze several things. Depending on the issues that arise from this analysis, you may figure out that you need to come up with a new data set that uh, lets you explore uh, what you want uh, uh, in a better way. And, and perhaps you need then a new model and, and you keep iterating in this process, okay? So that's a little bit work in this area. And I think this applies also to other uh, applications as well. So let me, so I'm gonna highlight three works here and let me start with the data part unless there are questions unless you want to take a break that's one thing no breaks no questions all good here <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> all right all right um okay so let me go back to my english nepali okay so as i said you go to this opus repository you find that uh here is the data that you have available and so uh, another way to draw it is with this table where essentially you have some Bible data that originates in English that has been translated into Nepali, some genome Ubuntu data, again, originated in English, translated into Nepali. And then you have a bunch of monolingual data. Monolingual data is just a raw text in each language from Common Crawl, which is just, um, you know, uh, the uh, World Wide Web, right? And uh, you can get data and you can filter for, for that specific language. You have Wikipedia, which is a subset of Common Crawl. And perhaps what you want to do is, you know, translate Wiki, uh, Wikipedia documents from English into Nepali. Now, the question is, how do you want to evaluate? Because there is no such a parallel data set in Wikipedia, right? And which is a pretty uh, generic uh, domain too. So, 
A couple of years back, we started this uh, effort to build an evaluation benchmark on low resource languages. And we started with Nepali, uh, Sinhala, uh, Khmer, and Pashto. And we took uh, documents from Wikipedia in each language, and we translated to and from English. And so now we have some evaluation, uh, pretty good evaluation benchmark in these four languages. And you may say, well, so what? Okay, this is useful, but uh, I, why would I care about this? Well, it turns out that there is no, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no a clear uh, documentation on how to even collect a machine translation data set. What guidelines to give to translators, to evaluators, and what is the pipeline, okay? Uh, and there are a lot so of interesting questions, yep. These were not parallel rain text. These were just articles Yep, yep, and um, which we plan to translate in uh, uh, to and from English to build a parallel okay. dataset for evaluation. Yeah, and so the question is, uh, for instance, none of us speak any of these languages, um, unfortunately. And so, how do you make sure that whenever you send a sentence to a translator, that the translation has good quality? It's not obvious, uh, and so. The way that we did it was by using this pipeline. So after translating, we have a set of automatic checks. And these automatic checks uh, are several. So for instance, we train a language model on each language and then check the perplexity of each translation. So is it fluent enough, essentially, according to a language model? Another check was about uh, transliteration. Is uh, the translator simply transliterating, which is, let's say if you go from English to Nepali, you can write an English sentence in Nepali uh, characters, but without translating, just uh, using uh, the sounds in, in, in the characters of the language. Or uh, another check is making sure that the translator is not simply copying from a machine translation engine like Bing or Google Translate. And you'll be surprised, but that was the most typical issue that we had. And so that relates to, well, how much uncertainty is there for translating this sentence? Could it be that there are very few ways and, and, and so happens that uh, the translation from the search engines matches, right? And so uh, um, I'm not going to go into the details now, but uh, there are very interesting scientific questions about how to measure the quality of these translations and also deciding when to stop, right? So here I have feedback loops where you say, okay, if uh, the perplexity is too high, we are going to go back to, we are going to tell the translator that uh, they need to improve the translation. Or if the human evaluation is not uh, high score enough, we go back to uh, another translation round. But when do you stop? When is, a, a, uh, when is the translation good enough? And so um, eventually, uh, so I don't think I have an answer to these questions. What we did was to set uh, for, um, like to look at the distribution, for instance, for language modeling, we look at the distribution of perplexities and, and look for outliers essentially. Um, and, uh, and so looking at the distribution of, of sentences in each language and across languages and, and looking for outliers, that, that's essentially the, uh, the method that we used. And so uh, here are some examples of sentences in the, from this uh, Wikipedia in Sinhala that were translated into English. And you can see that, for instance, from the uh, if you look at the second sentence, it's not in, even though we had all those checks and and and, and uh, controls, it's not super fluent, right? Um, and another things that you may want to uh, notice is that if you read the translations here and if you read uh, sentences from English Wikipedia, you see that the topics are a little bit different, and in fact. A lot of documents from the Sinhala Wikipedia are about religion, are about very uh, their history uh, of that country. And so, uh, and this is quite interesting. And we will see the effect of this uh, difference of domains uh, later in the lecture. Okay. So, uh, this is a sustained effort. And in fact, in a 
Uh, you can find this data uh, publicly on this website. And in a month, we are going to release an even bigger data set with more than 100 languages. And we are also organizing a competition at the uh, WMT, which is a uh, yearly workshop on machine translation. And they do a yearly competition. And we are going to have uh, a competition uh, on more than, 100, more than 100 languages. And we are also giving compute grants to qualified participants. So if you're interested in machine translation or work on mach machine translation, think that you have good ideas about how to solve um, uh, machine translation for those languages, please uh, take a look or contact me. Okay, so um, the point of this part is that data collection is not trivial. There are a lot of tricky questions and um, it's very important also to look at the data, uh, to have a, an idea uh, for uh, the issues that are there. And I come back to this uh, later. So the next part, unless you have questions on this part, is about modeling, and that's the meat of the lecture. No, I think we are good for now. OK. OK. So. Um, I start with uh, explaining how standard machine learning algorithms can be applied to low resource machine translation. And then I'll go over some uh, validation of these approaches and then um, give some perspectives. Okay? So let me remind you, this is the kind of setting that we have where we have multiple languages and multiple domains, but eventually we want to maximize translation accuracy uh, on a certain domain for a language pair. Okay? So this is the setting that we are looking at. So uh, if we think about the kind of data that we have in machine translation, it is interesting to uh, think about how this can be mapped to machine learning techniques. So if you have just a parallel data set, that's like a label data set, then we are talking about supervised learning, standard supervised learning, right? Now, you may have monolingual data, which is just text in each language without any translation. So that corresponds to uh, having, besides pairs of X and Ys, also Xs. So that's the typical semi-supervised learning setting. Um, if you have only Xs and only Ys, maybe it is just about doing unsupervised learning. When you have multiple language pairs, then uh, let's say that you're interested in doing English to Nepali, but now you have uh, also English Hindi. So then it's a little bit similar to multitask learning where you're interested in a task and now you add another um, classification head for a related task. If you do, let's say Nepali English, and now you have also Hindi English data, then that resembles a little bit multimodal learning, in the sense that you add another modality at the input uh, for, for the same uh, prediction task. And now we also have multiple domains. And so the kind of, when you have multiple domains, naturally you are thinking about domain adaptation techniques. And so it's gonna be interesting to see which domain ad adaptation techniques are ap applicable to machine translation. And so let's start with a simple setting of supervised learning. So in, uh, in supervised learning, you have a parallel data set. Let's say you want to translate from English to Nepali. You have a bunch of sentences in English that are translated into Nepali. That's your training set. And you have a data set that you want to translate into Nepali. Okay? So the data set is this curly D of uh, pairs X and Y, X in English, Y is the corresponding Nepali translation. As I said before, you uh, can train this by maximum likelihood. Uh, this is the per sample loss. Essentially, you're trying to maximize the log probability of y given x, uh, the given y with the given x, right? And one way to represent this is by uh, this diagram where you have a blue encoder. It is blue because it processes English sentences. And the red encoder, uh, it is red because it processes, it produces Nepali um, translations and the X, so the decoder doesn't really produce a prediction, but a distribution over, uh, over uh, the space of Y. 
And uh, you have a human translator that has produced given the X, the Y reference. And so you can uh, compute your cross entropy loss and back propagate and update the model parameters to um, um, train your machine translation system. Now, if the parallel data set is very small, then you need to regularize. Right? And so there are standard ways to regularize. You can do drop out where you inject noise in the hidden state. You zero out hidden states at random. You can do label smoothing. So I don't know if in the class you explain label smoothing, but it's the idea here is that whenever you do a classification task, you usually have a target, which is one thought. You say, okay, the next word is uh, on. And so you, uh, you say that the target probability is going to be probability one to on and zero to all the other uh, tokens in the uh, vocabulary. Instead, with label smoothing, you say, okay, I give up a little bit of probability for on. Let's say instead of setting the probability to one, set it to 0.9. And the remaining 0.1, I spread it uniformly across all the other words in the vocabulary. And this is good for you because it prevents the model from overfitting to the small data set because you spread a little bit of probability mass uh, across uh, all the other words in the dictionary. And unless, yeah, uh, remember that a log loss is generally not very, uh, uh, you need to regularize always a log loss, otherwise the weights are not going to infinity. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's all simple and uh, this should be easy. So now what happens if you also have let's say monolingual data in English, okay? So you have raw, uh, a bunch of sentences in English. How would you use that to improve uh, the machine translation system? So this is a question for the audience. I give you a minute. So if in addition of these pairs of X and Ys, I give you also a bunch of Xs, how would you use this additional data to improve uh, generalization? Could you, I don't know, use the chat and tell Alfredo yeah, they can, how you they would can do it? On the chat, yeah. they, they can answer on the chat. Uh, yeah, they can give you like uh, suggestions or you can ask, actually yeah. ask for yes or no answers as well. Uh, yeah, if you, wait a minute. I don't know how to access the chat. Okay, let me see if I can. Be a bar and then you so have like a bar. The, the zoom, the zoom. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right yes, and yeah. side, there I is three dots. Gotcha. And then you have a chat. Yeah. And also, there is a question Thank about you. the transliteration I didn't ask you before. Okay. Yeah. What was the question? Uh, how do you tell good transliterations from bad transliter transliteration, by the way, in automatic checks? Since some languages do use their characters for proper nouns in the English language, like the Chinese version of Harry Potter just uh, is just a transliteration with Chinese characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first of all, transliteration doesn't mean word by word translation. Yes, I'm, I'm responding to the next question. <laughs> Sorry for that. But it means that you're using uh, the characters of one language to make a um, phonological translation of of the word in the foreign language, very much like the, the person from the first question was saying. Uh, so it's it's like using the Chinese characters to make the sound of the English word. Uh, now, it's true that sometimes you do need to translate for good purposes, but the checks that we are doing is, is let's say, 80% of the words in the sentence, are 80% of the words in the sentence transliterated? If that's the case, then we would have flagged the sentence for retranslation. Mm -hmm. okay. And also the word so, by word translation yeah. is monitoring by using the uh, perplexity. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah. The language model would have like that. Hopefully. Yeah. I, I mix the two things. Uh, my bad. No, no worries. So, okay. So I would just like to repeat the question back? you asked the audience. Yeah. So the question is, uh, we have a parallel data set of X and Ys. Okay. And we can train our cross entropy loss with that. Now, if I give you also a bunch of axes, I have a data set, an additional data set of axes. How would you use that in order to improve generalization? Okay, so 
Jeffrey says, uh, if the axes come from the same article, uh, then I can predict the, ne the next X uh, as a base for translation. That's a very good suggestion, sure. Um, although in general, it's very rare that you have access from the same document. <laughs> so that, that's a very strong assumption. Uh, Rahul says semi-supervised learning. And then uh, Ganesh say we can do essentially what Bert does. Very good, very good, very good. OK. Anybody else? There are like 56 more people that haven't answered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 fine. Um, these are very good suggestions. Um, and I go with one of them. So one way to leverage an additional data set that I call MS, okay, monolingual data for the source that has a bunch of X's, okay, is by trying to model P of X. That's what I guess Raul was saying with uh, the semi-supervised approach, right? Where you, in addition to P of Y given X, you also try to model P of X. And so, uh, what the, uh, one way to model P of X is by using the noise autoencoder, for instance, which uh, I'm pretty sure you cover in your uh, in your course. And so, with the noise autoencoder, what you would do, you would take uh, a sentence from this data set, this X of S. You would inject noise, for instance, by dropping words, by swapping words. So if the, if the sentence is the cat set on the mat, then it becomes, for instance, the set cat on the. So you drop mat, you swap uh, set and cat, you drop the, okay? So, so you inject a little bit of noise and then you try to uh, reconstruct the clean input, okay? And again, you do the reconstruction via cross-entropy loss. Why is this useful? Well, because uh, this blue encoder can then be shared with the machine translation system, right? So you're gonna improve the encoder by doing this. And of course you can pre-train with this or you can uh, train with both losses at the same time, that's fine. Um, one thing to be careful is the amount of noise. If you inject a lot of noise that you destroy the whole input sentence, you're just training the, the decoder. You're just doing language modeling and you're not training the encoder and that defeats the purpose. If you are not injecting enough noise, then the encoder decoder is going to have a very easy time to copy the input. And so you're not gonna learn anything useful. So there is a little bit of <laughs> trickiness in how you set the knob in how much noise you add. Another way to, uh, uh, and so this is the semi-supervised approach or the BERT approach that was proposed a little bit. Um, another way to leverage uh, unlabeled data on the source side is by doing uh, what they call self-training or pseudo-labeling. Um, this is an algorithm from the 90s. Uh, really, it's very old. And the idea is a little crazy. So the idea goes like this, that you take your sentence from the monolingual data set, you inject noise to it, you encode the code, you make a prediction. But now, notice that here you have the encoder and decoder of the machine translation system. So this is the, the red block that translates, that translates into Nepali, okay? So you are producing a translation, but now, you're not given the ground truth translation. You don't have a humans here. So what you do, you use a stale version of your model of your machine translation system to produce the desired output, okay? And the input to this is the clean version of X, okay? And essentially you train the parameters by minimizing uh, the sum of the standard cross entropy loss on the label data that you have on the parallel data, plus this loss on the monolingual data set. It's pretty crazy, right? So let me let me explain again how this works. You take the parallel data set D, you train your machine translation system, POY given X, and then you repeat the following. There are two steps. The first step is to decode with your current POY given X, the monolingual data set, so that you associate to each X of S a Y bar, which is your prediction for what the translation should be. And then you retrain the POY given X on the union of the original parallel data set with this 
fantasize artificial parallel data set AS. You will get a better model, hopefully, and then you can repeat the process. You can redecode and retrain, redecode and retrain. Now, people should ask the question as, why is this going to work? <laughs> so there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that when you produce the desired output, you are going to do typically beam search, for instance. And so what uh, you are trying to do then when you uh, uh, try to match the prediction to this desired output is to learn beam search. So usually beam search gives you an extra two, three blue points, okay? And here you are trying to learn that uh, uh, beam search uh, procedure. The second reason is because you inject noise here, and so, but you don't inject noise uh, when you translate, when you produce the target. And so you, by injecting noise, you're kind of smoothing a little bit uh, the, the output space. And so the combination of these two things is pretty critical to make such training works. In practice, it can be pretty effective, as we shall see later. Are there any questions on this? It looks pretty impressive. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? So this has been very useful also for speech recognition. People in the past year or two have found this to be very beneficial for speech recognition as well. Um, if you do um, object detection, people have been using also in computer vision uh, this approach. It is very old, but by no means uh, we invented it. Uh, we rediscovered it for machine translation. So I've uh, already mentioned that people should be puzzled, but maybe not. So wouldn't he reinforce the model's mistake? Excellent question, Itish. Yes, that's what I was thinking too. Uh, <laughs> it depends how you do it. So if you do it right, it may not. Uh, so the idea is that again, these white bar are not correct, okay? These white bar are not correct. However, you produce the white bar by doing beam search. And assuming that beam search improves upon standard decoding, okay, then when you train the model by predicting the output of beam search, you're gonna you're gonna improve because you're going to learn the beam search process, okay. And the second reason again is that you inject noise here. So by injecting noise, you make sure that uh, you are smoothing out. If the model before was overfitting and was kind of Imagine that you're doing classification for, for simplicity. So imagine that the output is a single token, okay? Maybe before you were overfitting and, and the uh, prediction surface was very irregular, by injecting noise, you're gonna smooth out that thing. And so that's gonna be helpful to include generalization. And so in practice, you're not reinforcing the mistakes if you do it this way. I do have a question. Last week we talked about, uh, so this would be like the Terby, right? Beam search, finding the lowest energy path, right? Yes. We also talked about, uh, instead of doing the to also do, to use the forward algorithm to have like a, uh, um, like a more than one correct uh, solution. Is also this done in translation? So, a little bit, yes. So what happens is that for very low source languages, the forward model is typically pretty poor. And so beam search is usually what we do. It's relatively efficient and, and improves performance compared to the baseline where you have greedy decoding. Greedy means where you do beam search with k equal to one. Um, for high resource languages for which the forward model is very good. And so the kind of uh, distribution that it produces at the output is well calibrated and, and uh, fitting pretty well the data, then what you can do is top case sampling. So then every time that you uh, generate a sample, you, uh, sorry, every time that you see uh, an access, you produce a different sample, which is a little similar to what you're saying. And that usually works better. But the model has to be good enough to do that. I see, I see. And then there is also a trade-off between how much compute. So every time that you do machine learning, <laughs> you have a budget, 
So maybe you meet your PhD advisor once a week. That's what I used to do with Jan, right? <laughs> so then <laughs> that, that gives you, you know, a time frame for you to work, right? And so uh, there is a trade-off between how much compute you spend on each example and how much data you see, right? So you can produce, let's say, 10 translations for every single input, and that will cost you 10 times more if you were to produce one, or you can see with one translation, 10 more examples. And it turns out that uh, it is typically better to see more data than less data, but do more compute for each data point. If you have enough data. Here, usually you have always a lot of unlabeled data. Oh, OK, 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 OK. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense, OK. Um, OK, so. If, uh, okay, let's go to the next case where instead of having a monolingual data set on the source side, we have a monolingual data set on the target side. So the way that uh, you can approach this uh, is by uh, first training a reverse machine translation system, a backward machine. So we are interested in doing English to Nepali, and instead of training that, we train a Nepali to English machine translation system. That's this uh, encoder decoder that you see here. Okay. That goes from Y to X. And so you take your sentence from the target side monitoring with data set Y, and you produce some translation X bar. Okay. And now you use this X bar as a noisy source for, uh, for your machine translation system that goes from X to Y, which is the one that you want to train. And the prediction is the, the Y, right? Uh, that you had uh, at the beginning here. So again, the algorithm works as follows. First, you train a backward machine translation system that goes from Y to X, okay? On the parallel data set that you're given. Use that to decode the sentences from the source side monolingual data set to produce an additional parallel data set with X bar and Y. And again, these X bars are not correct. They are produced by the backward machine translation system. And then finally, you do what you want, which is you train your forward machine translation system that maps X to Y on the union of the original parallel data set with this additional fantasized parallel data set 80. And, that, and this algorithm is called back translation. So you, if you zoom back, it looks like an autoencoder where the encoder is a machine translation system and the decoder is another machine translation system. Each of these is actually you know, an encoder decoder system. And uh, typically you just do uh, one iteration of this, although you could further iterate. And when you train, you never backpropagate through the uh, backward machine translation system. You could do that, but it's very expensive and usually it's not worth doing it. Uh, so the idea, the idea here is that the prediction is correct. You know it is correct because it comes from you know human written sentences in, in Nepali. So that means that the decoder is going to improve a lot because it's going to predict not corrupt uh, targets like in set training, but the targets are correct. The issue is that there is some biased noise in the source sentences, but usually this is a very good way to do data augmentation. And for the same amount of data, if the domains match, that translation works much better than set training just because the targets are correct. I see uh, a lot of things going on. No, no, I was clarifying uh, that we call the ah, other, okay. we call it predictor because we move from the X space to the hidden representation of the Y space. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so if there are no questions, then I'll try to combine these two algorithms. Sounds good. And so this whole lecture is about algorithms and I hope uh, this is okay. So uh, here, so the idea here is that now you have your little parallel data set, but now you're given also a source and a target side monolingual data set. And so what you do 
is very is straightforward because you're combining side training with back translation. And the algorithm is here on the right. So you first train on the little parallel data set um, backward machine translation system that maps y into x, and the forward machi machine translation system that maps x to y, which is the one that you are ultimately interested in. And then you repeat an iterative process that, that alternates between two phases. One phase is the decoding phase in which you use the uh, backward machine translation system to decode the target side monolingual data set to produce uh, a data set uh, of parallel sentences, AT. And you use the forward machine translation system to decode the, to decode the source side mono, monolingual data set to produce another uh, parallel data set, AS. Okay? This AT and AS are machine generated. And then you retrain both the forward and the backward machine translation system on the union on all these data sets. And you repeat the process. Okay. And again, you train by minimizing, sorry, the, the cross entropy loss, very much like if uh, it was just a single data set. Okay. It's very simple and very effective. Um, maybe since this is a machine learning course, uh, something to think about for you is, is how this resembles YAM. So you can think that here we are doing some sort of hard EM because you can think about this uh, sentence in English to be a latent variable, right? It is latent because it, it is not observed, but it turns out to be, in this case, an English sentence. And so what in this phase is like you're doing uh, the E step where you're inferring the latent variables by doing hard EM, you're doing beam search, right? And then in this phase, you're updating the parameters. That's the M step. Okay, so that, that's another view on what's, what's going on here. If you, um, yeah, if you put everything together in a single kind of uh, probabilistic model or, or model. Um, any question? I guess it is all clear, I hope. So then uh, the next question is, how do we deal with multiple languages? So let's say that we have our parallel data set for English and Nepali, but now we also have some parallel data set between English and Hindi, okay? So we have this additional uh, parallel data set, uh, perhaps also between Nepali and Hindi. So how do we, uh, so we have a lot of presumably parallel data between English and Hindi, we can build a machine translation system. And the question is, how can we transfer knowledge between the English Hindi machine translation system and the English Nepali machine translation system? Well, we work with neural nets and that's beautiful because it makes this transfer learning very easy because we can share all parameters except for one embedding that specifies the language. So we can have a single machine translation system, a single encoder, a single decoder here, we can again feed a source sentence at the input, produce a translation at the output, but which language? So we can specify the language by feeding, by uh, prepending an additional token on the source side, uh, and this token will specify the language that you want to translate your sentence into. So we have one language uh, ID token per language, and so this will take care of translating from English to Nepali, English, Hindi, uh, all combinations. And so you will share all parameters except for this language, language embedding. So that's super simple, I hope. Um, and I think that's everything that I wanted to say here. Uh, and uh, so, um, if you were to code this, it would be you do simple cross entropy loss, you stack all your data sets together, you just need to remember to uh, add an extra token on the source sentence that specifies the language that you want to translate, translate into. How do we deal with domain adaptation? So we said that oftentimes the training data set is in another domain than the test data set, right? Now, if you have a small in domain validation data set, 
what you can do is to do to apply some domain ad adaptation techniques. One very simple technique is fine tuning, and you'll be surprised that this is, I would say, it takes you 95 percent of the way. <laughs> we try so many other things, but this one is super effective and super simple. Essentially, you train your system on domain A. And then you do a few weight updates on uh, the validation data set, and then you deploy, and you're good. Another thing that which you could do is to add another token. So if you know that each data set, if you know that um, uh, uh, this sentence uh, comes from this data set that, that belongs to a certain domain, then you can also prepend a token that specifies the domain. And that's called domain tagging. Okay, So that's also another way to do domain adaptation, where you say, I give you the source sentence, I give you the token for the target language, and that also tell you that this is about news, so that the model has a way to factor out uh, the, the, the topic from uh, the, the translation. Um, Okay, so the basic idea is that there are several pretty basic machine learning approaches that can be used and combined for tackling low resource machine translation. At the very high level, the basic idea is how to come up with ways to do data augmentation. And this turns out to be also in machine translation, but that's true also in computer vision and other domains, the most powerful way to improve generalization. The approaches that I describe are very generic and they can be applied to other domains. There is something that is very specific and that's the fact that machine translation is a symmetric task, typically. It's not quite true because there is the fact that you can go from a language that is not inflected to one that is inflected, for instance, and that makes the, the thing not quite symmetric, but roughly speaking, it is symmetric and that's why we can use bad translation. If you were to do, let's say, object recognition images and predict an image into, let's say, 10 categories, going from the category to the image is actually a very difficult task because you need to learn a generating model, right? And that's perhaps more difficult than doing the classification task in the first place, maybe. So in machine translation, that's simpler because going from X to Y and from Y to X is roughly has the same complexity. So that's the only task specific thing that we use, but other than that, there is nothing that is specific to the language pair, whether we do English Nepali or English French, we use pretty much the same uh, techniques and uh, there is nothing specific to the language pair, which is the beauty because you let the model learn from data how to solve the task. Uh, and so this allows us to also translate 100 languages at the same time uh, using the same toolbox. Are there questions? I don't see anything here. Okay. So the conclusion so far is that um, there are several, several training paradigms that can be combined. How to combine them is actually uh, tricky, very tricky, because sometimes uh, even a little bit of domain mismatch may help generalization because it's kind of a noise, right? And whether you need you need to wait more one technique versus another, depends on the language pair, depends on the capacity of the model, depends on how much data you have. So it gets pretty empirical in practice and, and, and it takes a little bit of uh, understanding uh, to combine these different approaches, uh, unfortunately. And I think there is quite a bit of work to be done to abstract principles on how to combine these things. And I think the field right now is, all in trying to figure out how to um, automate this process of combining these different algorithms. So uh, unless there are questions, I'm gonna go on some examples of this, uh, starting from unsupervised machine translation. So um, let's consider that you have uh, just monolingual data, let's say in English and French, that's not a very, useful, non realistic uh, use case, but for simplicity, let's say that uh, you want to translate from English to French without any parallel data. Um, 
So what you could do, you can take a sentence from the target side monolingual data set. You have some machine translation system that goes from uh, French to English. You uh, feed the French sentence, you produce some sort of English translation. Initially, it's going to be just random words. But you don't have the ground truth reference. So what you could do is to feed this translation to another machine translation system that goes from um, English to French. That's uh, a little bit similar to the back translation thing that we saw before. And here notice that I'm using color to indicate to which language the uh, block is operating. So here I have a decoder that is blue because it operates in English. And here the decoder is blue because it operates also in English, while the red uh, refers to French. Now, if you just do this, this is not going to work at all. And the reason is because there is no uh, uh, constraint on the X bar. There is no reason to believe that the X bar is going to be a valid English sentence. And so the same trick, which has been for uh, autoencoding or psycho consistency, uh, sorry, a cycle consistency has been also used for in computer vision for style transfer to turn zebras into horses and vice versa. Now, in their case, this thing, this uh, little uh, algorithm worked because they added a constraint on the X bar. They had a discriminator that was making sure that whatever was produced here was a valid uh, item from the desired domain. In our case, we cannot really add the discriminator here because it's a discrete sequence of tokens. It's kind of difficult to backdrop. It's a little messy. It's not that you cannot, but it is, it is uh, difficult to do, but to get it to work at the very least. So one way to get around this is to uh, make sure that the decoder produces valid English sentences. And so, uh, we can guarantee that, or we can try to uh, get that by uh, adding a denoising of the encoding um, term to the loss function. And so we can, we can take a sentence from the source side monolingual data set, inject noise, go through the encoder decoder. And now this decoder, if you do this, is going to learn a good language model. It's going to produce fluent English sentences. And now when you plug this decoder over here, it should also produce fluent English sentences. And you do the, you do the same with this encoder and decoder array that operates in French. Now, if you do that, it's not gonna work again. And the reason is because while this may work, the decoder, the blue decoder may only work when it is fed with the output of the blue encoder that operates on English sentences. But there is no reason to believe that it may work when you feed it with the output of this red encoder that is fed with French sentences. And the reason is because there is no reason to believe that there is going to be modularity, that you can you know, uh, swap these modules in any way that you want. And so it could be that uh, the model, and it turns out to be the case, that the model will partition the feature space in such a way that it works well when it is fed with the blue encoder, but it works very poorly when it is fed with the red encoder. And so what do we do about it? So one way to fix this is by sharing all parameters of the encoder and decoder so that the feature space is shared no matter whether you feed a French or an English sentence. So now we have only one encoder and one decoder. So we don't have a, a, a red encoder and a blue encoder. We just have one encoder and we have one decoder. We specify the language with a language ID. And uh, if we do this parameterization with these two loss functions that we can get, uh, the uh, machine translation system to learn even without a single parallel sentence in some cases. Um, and so again, you see that we have been using the three building blocks that I described before. One is iterative back translation, the other is denoising of encoding, and the other is multilingual training. So how is it this token used this LID? So it's like a multiplicative interaction that is changing the weight. So it's like a hyper network or? No, no, it is uh, you add one extra position to the input 
yeah. and uh, and you fit it. It's just like if the sentence was uh, had one extra token at the input, you embed that, and then that goes into your transformer block, and, and so on and so forth. Like if if it was any other symbol in your uh, sentence. And these axes are not the one hot encoding, right, of the input. So, it's so uh, yeah, so this X is the sequence of tokens. Okay, so it is the cat set on the net, followed by language ID. And so the language ID is just another token in the vocabulary, and that goes, uh, all of these are embedded, and they are fed to a uh, transformer block. Yeah, my, my question was this yeah. this token this token you're sending are one hot encoded or yeah. there is some other yes yes it oh, is wow. one hot and then and then you embed it right uh -huh. it's gonna be embedded and then it's gonna be fed to a transformer block so for each language you're gonna have a different one hot encoding and the token yeah. lid can tell you which vocabulary to to use basically yeah and oftentimes there is overlap between the vocabularies particularly if you break down the words into character engrams, like we usually do. And so you're gonna, this is going to help aligning also. So let's say, particularly for English French, the vast majority of uh, the tokens are shared, right? And so the LID, uh, the, the English token is just gonna tell you, hey, I want to translate into English as opposed to uh, produce a French sentence. I see. And then if you're using Chinese or other things that don't share the same n-grams or n- So, so, so in, in, that, in that case, in that case, then, um, so this goes a little bit into preprocessing. So what you do, if you do English Chinese translation, you got a lot of monolingual data in English, a lot of monolingual data in Chinese. You're gonna treat this as a, a single data set and you're gonna learn um, a way to compress the data using character engrams. That's called byte encoding. And there are, it's like a half month coding of, uh, like treat this big data set as a long string. And the question is how can you break it down into character engrams so that you compress it the most, okay? And so, of course, because it is English and Chinese, there is very little overlap. But that's okay. But that's okay. There is still going to be some overlap numbers, some uh, like uh, foreign words, and that's usually sufficient to uh, uh, learn a shared presentation over here. Okay. What matters more in practice is very much the domain of the source and the target, actually, uh, as uh, we'll discuss later. So how does this work? Uh, so since 2018, this has been improved by quite a lot, but here is the idea. So uh, consider just the blue curve for now. So the dash blue curve is what you get uh, on this data set, <laughs> which is a standard data set for machine translation. Uh, if you train in an unsupervised way, the neural machine translation system. So you got 25 blue, which is, you got, pretty fluent, pretty decent translations, actually. If you were to train in a supervised way, and on the x-axis here, you have the amount of parallel data, you got this blue curve. And so it turns out that by using about 10 million uh, monolingual sentences in each language, and by training in a supervised way, you got the same performance as if you were to use about 100,000 parallel sentences. <laughs> like saying that, each parallel sentence is about worth 100 uh, monolingual sentences, which is pretty interesting. And this is the case, this is in the case where the languages are very similar and in the case in which the domains are perfectly matching. If you take English Chinese, that is much more distant, and if the domains of the two monolingual data sets are more different, then this ratio is going to increase by a lot. And that tells you why low resource machine translation is actually very large scale learning because you need to compensate uh, for the lack of data supervision by adding more and more data and by making the model bigger and bigger so that it learns a lot of things and among 
all of these things, there will be something that is useful for the task that you're interested in. Um, okay. If there are no questions, then I'm gonna go on the second example, which was uh, Nepali English, which has been the running example throughout this lecture. In this case, uh, the evaluation dataset is from the Flores dataset, is from the uh, collection effort that I described before. For training, we don't have any in-domain parallel data from Wikipedia. We have some out-of-domain data, like uh, you, you know your Bible genome and so on and so forth. And we have a bunch of monolingual sentences in each language. So if you want to do, because we don't have a lot of uh, parallel data and because it is out-of-domain, if you are, uh, if you train supervised, you got pretty poor performance, 7.6 blue. So it's barely understandable. Um, if you do unsupervised learning, it doesn't work at all in this case because the two monolingual data sets are from different domains and there is no way to, to you know, to find correspondences essentially. If you were to train by using the parallel data set plus the monolingual data set, you do quite a bit better than just doing uh, supervised learning. And uh, if you iterate, you improve further. So if you do this uh, uh, iterated by translation, then uh, you improve quite a bit. Now, if you add also English Hindi data, then you dramatically improve across the board. In particular, also the unsupervised uh, learning setting starts working. Now, it is unsupervised because you don't have any parallel data between Nepali and English, but it is supervised because you have parallel data between uh, English and Hindi, okay? So, and because of that, and because Hindi and Nepali are similar, now you got to jumpstart the process, this iterated by translation with the noise of the and then you got also the unsupervised learning to work for English and Nepali. Why using Nepali and Hindi here? Is it because the two languages are more grammatically similar? Does this show good performance in like Nepali and Italian? Yes, it is because they are similar. That's why we picked them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is very useful if you can find, if you have a lower source language and there is a relative nearby language that is high resource, uh, that's super helpful. If you don't, uh, usually, Again, it is the same thing that I said before. You can also use uh, English, Italian, other languages that are not so related. That usually helps, but it doesn't help as much. And if you want to for it to help as much, you need to add so much data from those languages that it becomes super large scale because you need to compensate. Uh, this is pretty much what I'm saying here. That I'm making a silly argument, but just to give you the idea that if in the supervised learning setting, each datum gives you X bits of information to solve the task, and you have N examples and you need a model size Y megabyte to solve it, in the unsupervised learning setting, for instance, each datum is gonna give you, let's say, a fraction of that information, let's say a thousand times less. But if it gives you 1000 times less, that means that you need roughly speaking, a thousand times more samples and also a model that is much bigger. And now to go back to your question about why Hindi, now if you use something that is less related, if the domains are mismatching more, then you need to increase much more because the amount of information that you get is even less. I hope it is clear. And to me, this is, something that I didn't know before I started working on this. And I think it is, you know, maybe obvious in retrospect, but um, it is something to, to think a little bit when you st start working on, on an application. Okay, I have 15 minutes left. I could go over the analysis uh, part unless there are some questions. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I feel sorry that you don't have a single break, but hopefully <laughs> I give you five minutes at the end. So you, you can, uh, I hope you don't have another class afterwards. So um, let's talk a bit about analysis and um, let's think about simulating 
the lower source machine translation stuff. Let's take our French to English that we are all very familiar with. And let's take a, a data set of Europe, uh, Europe Parliament proceedings, uh, extract 20,000 parallel sentences uh, to simulate a lower source setting. And let's take some monolingual data, 100,000 sentences on the target side, apply by translation. We find that the blue score goes from 30 to almost 34. That's great. That's a very good improvement. Like you can publish at the top tier NLP venue if you got an improvement of 0.5 blue. Here we got 3.4. So that's great. Right? Now, I was very excited by this uh, when we uh, did this. And so we applied this to uh, public posts uh, uh, in English and Burmese. And uh, we did this very same thing. And now we got. 0.1 blue, how comes? And we check how it is optimizing, we check how we initialize, we check, you know, the training, nothing worked. So what's going on? So what's going on, you can see it already in the Flores data set, right? So we were saying that if you look at the data, you find that if you look at these uh, translations from Sinala compared to original sentences from English Wikipedia, you see that the topics here are pretty different from those that you find in English Wikipedia. Is that a problem? Well, maybe. So if you look at English Wikipedia and Chinese Wikipedia, so we train classifiers on, uh, on documents uh, randomly taken from the two Wikipedias, and you find that the topic distribution between uh, documents sampled from English Wikipedia and Chinese Wikipedia are quite different. I don't know. For instance, in English, they talk much more uh, about film, while in the Chinese Wikipedia, there, there are many more documents about animal for some reason, right? Even if you take two countries that speak roughly the same language, US and UK, for the same topic, let's say we look at sport magazines, you'll find that uh, sport fans in the US talk more about football, baseball, and so, so forth, while in, in the UK, it's more about soccer, for instance, right? So, uh, people in different places of the world uh, talk about different things. So the distribution of topics is different, and that's for a variety of reasons. One of which is that uh, people talk about what happens in where they live. And so if there is a snowfall in your city, it's unlikely that there is a snowfall in Hong Kong and people are going to talk about different things. <laughs> there are cultural things as well. And then for the same topic, there is also a different distribution of words. So it turns out that uh, uh, typically in machine learning and also in machine translation, we always consider a domain mismatch between the training and the test distribution, right? So we assume that we have some data uh, when we train, and then when we test, we have a slightly different domain, and therefore we need to do domain adaptation. And before we talked about fine tuning, domain tagging, right? But here we are talking about a different kind of domain mismatch, which is a source target domain mismatch. So we have some data that originates in the source language. This, so this is written by people, right? And these are human translations. That belongs to a domain, DS, right? And then we have some other data that uh, originates in the target language that belongs to another domain, okay? And these two domains don't match. Now, could this be a problem? Well, I think it could be a problem because now if you, let's say, use by translation, even if you were to perfectly translate this target sign monolingual data over here without any mistake, this data is out of domain. And therefore, if you're interested in translating from the source domain to the target language, this data is going to be much less useful. So the question that I have for you is, how can we test this hypothesis? And, you know, am I fantasizing a problem or is the problem real? How can we study this problem? And so, um, let me tell you a little bit about this. So first of all, there is a little bit of an abstraction. So one thing that you may want to do is to measure how much domain mismatch there is, right? Because if you can measure, then you can quantify and you can really see if there is such a problem. So let's say that there are in 
an ab abstract concept space, there are two domains. And from these two domains, we can sample sentences. And this is like a, an interlingua domain. And then from these uh, sentences, from these two different domains, we can uh, uh, produce sentences in each language, okay? So these are realizations of, let's say, sport news in English and realization of, uh, I don't know, politics uh, news in, into uh, Nepali, okay? Then let's assume that we can do perfect human translations and that there are no uh, mistakes when you translate. Now we have sentences in the same language which we may be able to compare. And one very simple way to compare is to do uh, to compute the TF-IDF matrix of, of this data. So you compute how many times each word appeared, normalize a little bit, and then you can apply an SVD factorization. So now each sentence in its corpus is represented by a distribution over topics. Okay. And now if you now all you need to do is to compare these two matrices. So the, the matrix on the top comes from uh, the source language, right? And the matrix at the bottom comes from the sentences from the target uh, domain. And now, if we can compare uh, these uh, distribution topics, that's all we need to, to say whether the uh, two uh, data sets are similar. And so one way to do this is you take one row here that corresponds to one sentence, and you compare it to every row here uh, of uh, the data set below. And you can average across sentences. So essentially, you take a dot product between these two matrices, and then you average the score. And then measure the similarity between uh, data set S and data set T. And then we can come up with a score for the similarity of the two data sets by normalizing across the such similarity for the uh, source and the target domain. Okay, And so if the two domains were perfectly matching, then when you do a uh, data product, you know, of a uh, vector with itself, you may, you get roughly one. And so this score, you get one plus one plus uh, divided by one plus one. So the score is going to be equal to one. If the two uh, topic distribution are non-overlapping, so they are totally orthogonal to each other, then when you do the dot product, you get zero. And so on the numerator, you get zero. On the uh, denominator, you get two. And so the score is going to be zero. So, um, so the score is going to go from zero to one, depending on the similarity between the two uh, data sets. And now, in order to verify whether this is a good scoring function, we build a control setting. Because if you want to understand a problem, it's good that you build a control, a control setting to make sure that the only thing that varies is the, uh, how much domain mismatch there is. And so we took. Uh, two very different data sets, uh, one from Europar, which is uh, uh, European Parliamentary Proceedings, and one is open subtitles from movie subtitles. And we pretend that the Europar data originates in French, and we pretend that the open subtitles data uh, originate in English. So if we do this, then the two domains are essentially not uh, overlapping very much. And then what we can do, we can define the target domain as a convex combination of these two data sets with an alpha that is in between zero and one. So by varying alpha, the amount of data, both parallel and monolingual data is the same, but we vary uh, how much the target domain is in domain with the uh, source domain. In particular, if alpha is equal to zero, then the two uh, uh, domains are uh, very different. If alpha is equal to one, they are perfectly matching. And so let's see how this scoring function that we came up with, uh, this SDM score uh, works as we vary alpha. And, and you can see that the relationship is pretty linear, which is what we want. So it seems that the scoring function that we came up with works pretty well. Let's see how it works in uh, actual data sets. So if you use a WMT, data set that is highly curated, you have very mild uh, STDM uh, uh, source target domain mismatch, except for Chinese English. And if you look at the data, the translations, you actually realize that the way that they constructed the data set is that Chinese news are much more local. And that's why you see a drop in the STDM score. Now, at the bottom here, we have Facebook data. And Facebook data for Nepali English or Japanese English has much lower STDM score than, let's say, German English, which is what you would expect. So uh, we are good. 
And now, how is STDM affecting training? So on the x-axis, we have the value of alpha, where alpha is equal to one is target domain matches the source domain, and zero is target domain is totally different from the source domain. And again, the amount of parallel data, the amount of monolingual data is the same. What changes is the domain. And so as you can see here, as you make the target side much, uh, much more in domain, performance improves, and the dashed line is supervised learning. And here, uh, the dash dotted dash line is bad translation. As you can see that bad translation suffers a lot when there is a lot of domain mismatch, while self-training is much more robust. And if you combine the two, you get the, the, the dotted line. So our hypothesis was correct. So in this control setting, we really see that bad translation suffers in this domain. However, if you increase the amount of monolingual data, which is what you see here on the x-axis, you find that uh, bad translation can catch up with that training. So if you use three times more monolingual data on the target side, you get the same performance as that training. Okay. So this is a little bit what I wanted to tell you, uh, and then there are practical applications, but let me give you some time to ask me questions and let me recap before that. So <clears throat> we talk about low resource machine translation as a practical application where you have you don't have a lot of label data. And besides modeling, there are two important things: data and analysis that shouldn't be disregarded. And one thing helps each other. In terms of the modeling, uh, I think everything boils down to figure out efficient way to do data augmentation. And, uh, and and in general, and I think many of the techniques that we describe are applicable also to other domains. Um, and 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 the other take-home message is that really, whenever you do um, training with little parallel data, it is about large-scale training because you need to compensate for the lack of the rest supervision that you have. So that said. I'd be happy to take your questions if you have any. It looks like there are no questions. <laughs> People you know, must be exhausted. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think it was very, very clear. And see, uh, it was very interesting topic. And people are actually, I think it was very clear. Uh, we really managed to follow along all around, I think. At least I managed to <laughs> follow what you were talking. <laughs> yeah, so I want to mention that feel free to email me if you have questions or if you need pointers. There are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, re really literature if you're interested in some of these topics, I'd be happy to follow up. And or if you're interested in discussing anything uh, on this, I'd be happy. Um, okay. I can understand the that. Yeah. Is it on the slide? Uh, uh, what? The email is on the slide. Should I give them to the, to the student later on? Yeah, you can. You can give my email. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess okay. that's it. Okay, thank, thank you. you for attending. <laughs> yeah, it was really a pleasure having you uh, with us today. You have a wonderful day, okay? You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye, Marco. Bye. Bye, Marco. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you.